Hello, and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, I continue with Inner City Hoodlum by Donald Goins. Put your headphones on, because before long, we're going to let the reading commence. Chapter 5 J. Newton's mother lived in a small house that rested just beneath the Harbor Freeway near Manchester Boulevard. Around hers were other small homes, quickly decaying with age and the inability and desire of the residents to keep them up. Only Mrs. Newton's home proudly displayed a perfectly green front lawn and a beautiful rose garden on either side of the badly cracked cement sidewalk leading up to the front door. Detective Jim Spence stood at the end of the walkway and admired the little white frame house. The roar of the freeway rush hour traffic was deafening. The smell of carbon monoxide and lead exhausts of the thousands of automobiles that passed only yards away was sickening. But even with that, thought Spence, the little house seemed to transcend the blight around it. Before approaching the black-reefed front door, Detective Spence glanced back at his partner leaning against the hood of the car. Thomas Baker smoked a cigarette and nodded to his friend. It had been decided that since Jay Newton had been dead only twelve hours, Spence would only question the bereaved mother. One detective was enough, and Spence knew that because he was black, he would be the one to approach the mother. The front door opened after his first knock. Detective Spence presented his badge to the young black man staring out at him with confused, painted eyes. Detective Spence, L.A. Homicide. I'm sorry, but... The young man stepped aside. Come in, please. Spence was relieved that the young black was present and was cordial. Are you related to Jay Newton? Spence asked as he walked into the tiny immaculate living room. I'm his brother, the young man replied, then added, Excuse me, I'll get mom. The house was clean and orderly. The furnishings were ancient. Nothing in the small house was newer than ten years old. But beyond that, there was a terrific sense of pride in everything about the place. Spence sighed to himself. Someone, he thought tries to hold their head up, and they get this. Damn. Detective, I'm Jay Newton's mother. She was older than expected. Her gray hair was tied in a tight knot behind her head. Her body was thin and wiry, and when she tried to smile, Spence noticed most of her teeth were missing. I'm sorry to bother you at this time like this, Mrs. Newton, but we're trying to find out what happened last night, and we... That's all right, Detective, Mrs. Newton interrupted. Noah, she said, turning to her other son, turn that music down. The roar of the freeway penetrating the thin walls of the house had deafened Spence. But now he heard it, a sweet clarinet playing the old Negro funeral song, A Closer Walk. Spence had not heard that song since the funeral of his grandfather when he was a little boy living in Macon, Georgia. The image of the small band, his parents and brother and sisters walking down the streets with that song being played, flooded his mind. A bitter anger rose inside his gut as Noah switched off the old battered record player. That's better, Mrs. Newton began. Please, come into my kitchen. I have some drink. Spence followed the old woman into the tiny room. An old stove and ice box sat on one side with a small table and four chairs in the center. On the table was a half-finished bottle of Jack Daniels. I know this don't look right, Mr. Spence, but it's all I've got. Would you care for some? Her hands were trembling as she poured herself a half glass of the whiskey. 
No, thank you, Mrs. Newton. Spence pulled out a cigarette and lit it. I just wanted some information about Jay. I hoped that maybe you could help me. Jay, Mrs. Newton began, was a young black man, Mr. Spence, trying to grow up in the world that didn't want him to. He got killed last night because he was too weak. Who were his friends, Mrs. Newton? Who did he hang out with? Spence knew he was being cold, but it was scenes like this one that always flashed through his mind and drove him on. No friends, Mr. Spence. No friends at all. Mrs. Newton took a long, slow drink from her glass, stared at her hands. She played with the cheek turquoise ring on her left pinky, her gnarled hands moving slowly. Spence could feel the tension in the room and the way in which the old woman was being pulled. He had handled situations like this before. The black people did not trust the police, and they did not trust each other. There was little, if any, communication between the victims and those who could help. The only ones who ever came out on top were the exploiters, those men, both black and white, who played on their fear. It always infuriated Spence, and this was no exception. Please, Mrs. Newton, your son was killed last night looting a boxcar at the freight yards. There were others involved, and unless we stop them, they're going to end up the same way. Noah stepped away from the wall and took a seat across from Spence. His black face was set and determined. Listen, man, my mother told you the damn truth. Leave her alone. Mrs. Newton looked up at Spence. He saw the meaning in her eyes. The aged black woman was going to live by the rules, the rules that protected her own people. Even if she understood that those rules were no longer acceptable, she would not break them. Spence rose from his chair. Okay, I'm sorry, Mrs. Newton. If you hear anything else, please. Detective Spence dropped his card onto the table, turned and walked through the small house and out the front door. He was greeted outside by the roar of the freeway, the smell of poisoned air and the setting sun. It had been almost 13 hours since the shooting, and Spence was beginning to think that this case would be another in the long line of unfortunate ghetto deaths. Just another wild black youth killed, he thought bitterly to himself as he climbed into the car with his partner. How did it go? Detective Baker asked as he turned the car around and headed out toward Manchester Boulevard. The same, Tom. Always the same. She don't want the other ones to get in trouble with the law. She thinks she's protecting them. Yeah, Baker replied, then fell into a silence. He knew what his black partner was going through, and through the years had come to understand the workings of ghetto life through his partner's eyes. The two men rode in silence down Manchester Boulevard toward Compton, watching the street hustlers emerge from the old dilapidated buildings as the night fell over South Central Los Angeles. The two detectives were virtually lost in their own thoughts when the message came over the radio. It took a moment before the contents of the police call dawned on them, then both Spence and Baker reached for the microphone. This is Alpha 2. Over, Spence said in a hurried, excited voice. Hold suspect at point of apprehension, over. Compton and Slauson? That's only a couple of blocks away. Baker turned the car around in the middle of Manchester, then sped toward Compton Boulevard. We got some fucking sharp dudes out there to find those watches. Spence was visibly uplifted. The scene at the Newton home moments before had shaken him, but now, after the call reporting that the watches stolen from the train had turned up on the arm of the parking lot vendor had come in, his spirits were rising. Hold on, Baker warned as he turned up Compton, past the Paradise Room, and headed towards the shopping center where the suspect had been arrested. We don't know yet. I mean, it could be anything. No, Spence replied, lighting a cigarette. The dude who fenced those watches doesn't know anything yet. The killing was kept out of the papers. It's strange, though. What? What's strange? Baker glanced quickly at his partner. I mean, those kids. Whoever was there, they sure must have had a need to unload those watches so fast. A real need. 
Judging from the house we just came from, that need was money. It always is down here, Tom. Always. Spence picked himself up and sat upright as Baker pulled into the Manchester shopping center. A supermarket, a dime store, and a couple of other businesses sat in a straight line down the edge of the parking lot. Directly in front of the market were three squad cars. Five uniformed officers milled about in front, one of them speaking with a short, bald black man. Baker stopped next to the pair, and the detectives jumped out and approached the young black cop who was talking with Sam. The fence. You spot it? Spence asked excitedly as he examined the twelve watches lying in a row of the hood of the squad car. Yes, sir. I read the sheets this morning, and they sounded like the same watches. Baker stepped forward and wrote down the number of the young policeman's badge. Nice work, he said, meaning it. Real nice work. Thank you. The young policeman was obviously taken with the compliment. He smiled as he handed Sam's wallet to Spence. Sam Dole, 841 East 54th, is that you? For the first time, the little black man was confronted by Detective Spence. Just the build and demeanor of the black plainclothesman had inhibited Sam. Now, he was forced to speak with the man directly. Yeah, that's me, Sam replied, trying to sound gutsy and hard. These your watches? Spence held up one of the Swiss pieces and placed it about two inches from Sam's nose. Yeah, man, but what's all this shit about? Fuck, man, I ain't even do nothing. Sam's voice betrayed him. It was rising quickly into a strained falsetto. Where'd you get these, Sam? Silence. The little black man lowered his head as the larger black man glared at him. Baker leaned back against the fender of the squad car and waited. He knew that if anyone was going to succeed in getting that information out of this hustler, it would be his partner. I said, brother, Spence began again in a tone that defied Sam to ignore it. Where the hell did you get these watches? Sam scraped at the asphalt. Off a dude down in Mexico, man. Really? And how long ago was that? Spence's voice was becoming colder and darker with each question. Attention was rising, and everyone was feeling it. Oh, man, Sam answered after a little thought. About two weeks ago, yeah, two weeks ago, brother, I got him off a dude in Mexico. Sam smiled up at Spence, thinking that he had finally convinced the detective. You sure about that, Sam? Yeah, sure, man. Now what's going down here, man? I'm just a little guy making a buck. No fucking crime in that, is there? Spence took a long drag on his cigarette, then slowly ground out the butt beneath the heel of his shoe. Finally, he looked up at Sam with glowering eyes. Sam, you are under arrest for murder, what? These watches were stolen last night and a security guard was killed. That makes you our prime suspect, dig? Sam's mouth fell open and he struggled for breath. He would have revealed instantly his source had it not been for the image of Buddy and his deadly nunchaku flashing through his mind. Buddy and Johnny, they would come after him. Somehow, somewhere, they would track him down and crush his goddamn skull with that fucking nunchaku stick. He'd seen Buddy put the piece of wood through a door once, and it had looked like he hadn't even tried. You about ready to tell us where you got these watches, Sam? Spence watched the little man carefully. He knew already that Sam was weighing his alternatives. I told you, man. Mexico. Okay, Spence said, turning to the uniform officer. Take him downtown and book him. We'll finish this little conversation in the interrogation room. As the young black cop drove Sam off into the dark night, Baker and Spence climbed into their car and began driving to the police station. You think we've got something, Jim? Baker asked after a long silence. Yeah, Spence replied slowly. I think it's coming at him from both sides. No sweat, though. We'll break him before the night is over. The old brick building that housed the South Central Police Department was jammed with policemen and apprehended suspects. 
The first floor of the headquarters housed the main desk, where each new suspect was registered before being led away to the booking room. Most of the crowd were blacks, young blacks, old blacks, and a large array of young black women brought in on prostitution charges. Looks like a slow night, Spence mumbled as he and his partner walked quickly through the reception room to the old wooden stairway. Wait till summer, my friend. Everybody congregates here. Spence laughed. The two detectives climbed the stairs, made their way down the crowded hall, and were finally alone in the tiny, windowless interrogation room. The interrogation room was chosen specifically because of its cell-like quality, small in space, with no windows, and only one door leading to the outside hallway. In the center of the room was a small table, with chairs on opposing sides. A rickety old bench rested against the far wall, and a light bulb with a metal shade provided the only illumination. The atmosphere of the room did serve the purpose of giving the suspects brought here the unmistakable idea of what it would be like to be confined to a jail cell. The impression was not lost on little Sam. He was brought into the room by the arresting officer and left standing next to the doorway. The young black policeman returned Spence's nod, then closed the door behind him as he left. Spence leaned casually against the far wall, while Baker sat easily on the old wooden bench. Both men smoked cigarettes, and already the room was filling with gray smoke. Well, Sam, Baker began, startling the suspect because it was really the first time the white cop had spoken to him. What's happening? Nothing, man. Nothing. Except I'm in this joint for no good fucking reason. Sam's words were weak. His voice trailed off noticeably. Baker rose from his position on the bench and leaned across the table towards Sam. Now listen, Sam. You can get yourself out of here and back to whatever it is you do for a living. You know that, don't you? Sam looked first to Spence, then back to Baker. There was confusion in his eyes. The white man was being soft-spoken and almost kind. The black detective had practically threatened him with the gas chamber back there in the parking lot. It didn't make sense to Sam. After all, a brother was a brother. Well, Sam, Baker asked again, I told you where I got the watches, sir. Nothing else to tell. If there was, I certainly wouldn't be in here protecting a bunch of little creeps. Sam cut himself off. He saw the tall, muscular detective lean his black frame forward. Little creep, Sam? What do you mean by that? As Baker spoke, he passed a newly lit cigarette across to the fence. Sam accepted the smoke and inhaled quickly and nervously. Nothing, man, nothing. Sam sat down slowly in the little chair behind him. Beneath the harsh light, Baker and Spence saw the beads of sweat rolling down the man's bald pate. Baker stepped back from the table, turned to his partner, and shrugged his shoulders. Jim, he began quietly, I thought he would cooperate. All the way over here, I was telling you how he would cooperate. And now he's just copping out. Baker glanced quickly back at Sam, then slouched down into the bench. Detective Spence took his cue and stepped out of the corner and approached Sam slowly. The little black man could not take his eyes off Spence's hulking figure as the detective moved closer. Now shit, Spence began in a low-keyed yet threatening tone. I listened to you, partner, and I thought we had ourselves someone who would cop out. And I was right, wasn't I, Sam? Sam winced slightly as Spence stopped directly next to him. He could feel the detective's hot, threatening breath on his neck. His armpits were drenched with sweat, and little driblets were running down the front of his shirt. As Spence glared down at the little black man, he felt the rage that these sessions always created inside him. It was the fury of watching another black man trapped between the law of society and the law of the streets. 
It was a no man's land, an empty space of real estate where only a fool would tread. Yet, here was a brown-skinned brother caught in the web of the law and dealing with the law on its own turf. The man would not speak because he was more terrified of the street vengeance than he was of societies. It infuriated Spence to realize that the streets held more weight with his own people than did society. If society was corrupt, then the streets were downright evil. At least, that's what Spence believed. He felt he had to believe it because to him, it was his only salvation from madness. God damn it, you motherfucker! Give us those goddamn names! Spence's sudden outburst, his voice booming almost directly into Sam's ear, almost sent the little man reeling off his chair. Even Baker jumped. Please, man, Sam began in a tone that was more whimper than voice. Don't please me, you little shit. There's some kids out there in trouble, you bastard, and we're going to find them. Baker has seen his partner go through changes like this inside the interrogation room many times. But as many times as he had seen it, he still had not come to the point where he was used to the rage and bitterness he heard in Spence's voice. The tall black man's actions inside the small room still sent chills down Baker's spine. Please, Mexico. Sam was barely whispering when Spence grabbed him by the collar of his shirt and pulled him up right out of his chair. Sam stood frozen before the big detective, his eyes wide with fear and his mouth hanging open. You claim police brutality, you little cocksucker? And now fucking blow your brains out, dig? Sam nodded quickly. Spence held him a moment longer, then slapped the little man almost gently across the face. A squeak of pain shot from Sam's lips before he fell back into his chair. You ready, man? Spence demanded after Sam had settled down. But Sam was going to wait a little longer. Whatever Spence had done to him, he knew that it couldn't be worse than that nunchaku being whipped above his head by a revengeful buddy. Nothing, thought Sam, could be worse than that end. Okay, let's get the hell out of here, Tom. Baker rose to his feet and walked to the door. He held the door open and waited for his partner. Spence watched the relief work its way across Sam's face. He reached the door stopped and spoke one more time to the hunched over figure sitting at the small table hey baby spence called out you ever hear of a place in this building known as honky town spence watched sam's shoulders tighten he could see the man clench himself as if trying to keep his body from falling apart well spence began after a moment Honky Town is where all the motherfucking white dudes stay when they come visit. Dig? We separate the black from the white cause you ever imagine what would happen if we mix them? I mean those dudes are killers man. They just as soon cut your balls off as look at you. Ain't that right Tom? You bet. Mean motherfuckers. Baker replied. So. Spence continued, careful to draw his words out in the menacing street slang. You just watch it, cause that's where we bout to sing your ass. Motherfucker! Washington! What was that, Sam? Baker asked quickly. Washington! Johnny Washington! Sam's voice was etched with fear. He could barely pronounce the name. J J Johnny Washington? That's the dude who gave me the watches! His friend, man! His buddy! I don't know his last name, though! The arresting officer was standing outside the door, and Spence signaled him over. Keep him locked up for another 48 hours. If nothing's breaking by then, we'll hold him on a selling ordinance. Okay? The young black officer smiled. Yes, sir. I got you, sir. Spence patted the young officer on the shoulder as he and Baker moved away from the interrogation room. 
As the two men walked quickly toward the information center where they would file an all-points bulletin for the fugitives, Baker found himself smiling. What's so fucking funny, Tom? Spence asked. I don't know, Jim. Sometimes I think I know you pretty well, you know? But every time I go into one of those damn hot houses with you, I always feel relieved when I come out. It's like, it's like I was the one who was on the goddamn hot seat. Detective Spence laughed, then held the door open for his partner before replying, It's like they say about prisons, Tom. You can never tell who the real prisoners are. The inmates or the guards. Detective Baker chuckled. He knew exactly what his longtime partner meant, and it was good to be finished with the interrogation room, at least for tonight. Chapter 6 as an all-points bulletin went out over the airwaves of the Los Angeles police radios, Johnny Washington and Buddy were walking down Compton Boulevard toward the Paradise Room. The streets were filled with people beginning their night's work. The hustlers, pimps, and whores had all started to congregate, and music was blaring out of every bar and dive they passed. But both Buddy and Johnny felt troubled. The day had been a long one that had begun less than 24 hours ago when they had witnessed the brutal murder of their friend Jay. Both youths had returned to their homes in an attempt to get some sleep, but the gift had not come easily. They had met later in the day at Johnny's, and while Johnny's parents sat hypnotized in front of their television set, Buddy and Johnny had discussed their uncertain future. Shit, man, Buddy had said. I don't know what we're going to do now. Jay is dead, man, and we can't go back to that fucking yard ever again. Your folks, my folks, everybody depends on us, man. We got to get some coin. After the shock of Jay's death had worn off on Johnny, the young Negro began to see his predicament more clearly. He knew Buddy was right, and he also knew that both of them were in deep. There was no getting out. No hope of a reasonable solution. Johnny knew that they would both have to go all the way. We'll go see the Duke, man, Johnny had spoken, knowing that the Duke was their only way out. Seeking the help of the Kingpin's organization was the only way they would be able to protect themselves. So Johnny had suggested that they just walk down to the man's bar and offer their services. Now Johnny and Buddy stood across the corner from the Paradise Room. The evening traffic was picking up around the area, and the multitude of bars and dance halls gave the street a light, heady atmosphere. Damn, Johnny, this is the shit, Buddy said as he stared across at the club. Man, you got your nunchuckle? Yeah, man. I dig where you're coming from, but will the man even talk with us? Johnny looked at his young partner and grinned. His smile eased Buddy's worries. There was something about the way Johnny handled things that allowed Buddy a sense of confidence that he had never when he was alone with himself. Shit, Johnny explained. This man's king shit around here. We're two young studs looking for work. He'll take us on because he'll be thinking he'll have trained dudes on his force. Dudes, he got young and fresh, dig? Buddy nodded absently, then fondled his nunchaku sticks, which he kept concealed beneath his jacket. All right, man, we got nothing to lose. Johnny started across the street, and Buddy followed on his heels. Then Buddy noticed how Johnny was suddenly swaggering with a confident strut, and the shorter, heavier black youth tried to emulate his friend as they approached the paradise room. The Duke stood in his bedroom and admired the live, nude figure of Leslie, who was sprawled out across the circular bed. Man, he thought, she is certainly a fine bitch. The tall, dark man couldn't stop the smile that was forming on his lips as he continued to stare at Leslie's sleeping body. The knock on the apartment door brought the Duke out of his reverie. Quickly, he completed his dressing by pulling on his silken shirt and went into the living room. Joe was standing out in the hallway, looking sorry that he had interrupted his boss. 
My man, what's happening? The Duke's voice was friendly, and Joe broke out into a wide grin. Hey man, I thought I maybe caught you. Nah man, business is beginning again and I'm a happy man right now. So tell me what's going down. Two guys, real young, downstairs, wanna see you. The Duke followed Joe down the stairs and into the kitchen of the club where Johnny and Buddy waited nervously. Duke stopped at the entrance to the kitchen and examined the two youths. His mind recorded Buddy's stocky, powerful build and the way he stuck closer to his taller, thinner friend. The tall one, thought Duke, has keen eyes. Finally, Duke entered the brightly lit kitchen and faced Johnny and Buddy. Yeah, man, what can I do for you? Duke was in a tremendous mood. Leslie had done things for him that no bitch had done in years. It was because of this that he had agreed to meet with the two young men in the first place. Had it been otherwise in the bedroom, he would have thrown the young studs out the door. Mr. Duke, Johnny began, trying to sound calm and steady. Me and Buddy want to work for you. Is that right, my man? Duke was playing now, having fun with the two youths. Yeah, we can do almost anything, you know. Johnny felt relief with the man's attitude, although he wouldn't let the thought leave his mind that the Duke was a known killer. Uh-huh, Duke said, looking at each of them carefully. Finally, he rested his eyes on Buddy. That nunchaku stick you got there, pull it out. Buddy fumbled with his jacket trying to extract the stick. Finally, he held up the wired sticks and displayed them to the Duke. Johnny only watched in amazement. The Duke looked powerful and mean, and now Johnny realized that he also had brains. Can you handle that thing? The Duke asked Buddy. Buddy nodded, then released his grip on one of the sticks and swung it around in lightning quick circles. The Duke smiled. Let's make it out there in the alley and see what's happening with the shit. The Duke led the two young boys out behind the kitchen and into the alleyway. There was a wide open space between the trash cans and Duke walked to the center of this area. Joe stood behind at the doorway and watched closely, never taking his eyes off the stocky black kid who held the deadly nunchaku. Okay, my man, Duke began. Let's set up a little target practice here. Duke pulled two trash cans side by side, then found a large two-by-four board and laid it across the tops of the cans. Stepping back, he grinned at Buddy. Okay, dude, cut that wood in half. Johnny held his breath and waited. He knew that Buddy was being tested, and that if he failed, they both would be out in the streets again. The small group was silent as Buddy stepped up to the piece of wood. The chunky youth stared at the suspended board as though trying to break it with his concentration. He held the nunchaku easily at his side, gently swinging the free one back and forth. Suddenly, almost too fast for the naked eye to comprehend, Buddy whipped the stick in an arc across his shoulder and brought it down onto the wood. The board broke immediately and fell to the ground. The sound of the nunchaku hitting the 2 by 4 was like the loud snap of a bullwhip. Fuck shit, my man! Duke exclaimed. I never seen no dude handle that motherfucker like you just did. Shit, that was something else, man. Buddy broke out into a wide grin and turned to Johnny. Johnny smiled back at his friend. He had never seen Buddy work any more effectively than he just had. The Duke looked at the two young men and realized that if they were serious, he really had himself a find. The taller kid looked like he could handle numbers and accounts, while the nunchaku handler looked as though he could handle anything that might come up in the way of trouble. The Duke made his decision then and there. Back inside the kitchen, the Duke wrote down the addresses of three numbers' houses. He handed the paper to Johnny. I want those collections once and again at two this morning, got it? Johnny took the paper and stuffed it into his shirt pocket. Yeah, man. Thanks. Duke looked at Buddy and then back at Johnny. Don't mention it, my man. Just do a good job, and there'll be bigger things for both of you. 
As the two young blacks left through the rear door, Joe walked up to the Duke with a worried look on his face. Why you do that? They rip you off, the Duke laughed. Man, those houses aren't worth shit. One's run by two senile old sisters, and the others don't have nothing more than eating money. I just want to find out if those dudes are planning anything. If they come back tonight, then I know we got something happening with them. You dig where I'm coming from, man? Joe smiled and nodded his head. Duke turned and started to go back into the club, but stopped when he remembered the beautiful brown girl sleeping naked in his bed. Although he didn't know it at the time, he had set his mind to have another go at Johnny Washington's little sister. As Johnny drove himself and Buddy toward the address that the Duke had given him on 51st Street, he tried to assemble the plans in his head that he knew he would have to make. Now that he and Buddy had succeeded in landing a job with the Duke, that part was settled. They would work picking up numbers in an honest fashion, wait for something better from the man, but be satisfied with their present gig. But Johnny knew that that was not enough. That everything else about their lives would have to be changed also. Number one, thought Johnny, he would have to get out of his parents' house. Even though he had come home earlier that morning and slept, he knew it would be a mistake to do it again. He had realized after leaving Sam's that morning that he had committed a very bad error in unloading the watches. The police were looking for the murderer of the security guard, he knew, and the watches were the only evidence in existence. Johnny hoped that Sam would be discreet about unloading the merchandise, but he also knew that he could not trust the man that far. So he and Buddy would have to move out, get a motel room somewhere, and wait until they had enough money saved to rent an apartment. Johnny looked across at Buddy and smiled to himself. His friend had come through for them, and Johnny was proud. Hey, man, you did motherfucking good back there. Thanks, man. I was scared shitless. No need for that no more, my man, Johnny argued. You got it down to an art? Buddy grinned, lit a cigarette, and passed it across to Johnny. The two blacks were beginning to feel at ease, to know they were going to make it. Johnny pulled the car alongside the curb in the 5,000 block of 51st, then stopped in front of an old dilapidated house. The residential street was dark, and the old houses sat quietly and orderly. This is it, buddy, Johnny said as he stopped the car. What the fuck are we supposed to do in there? Johnny laughed as he opened his door. Man, we just walk up that sidewalk there, knock on the fucking door, and pick up the man's money. No sweat. Johnny waited for Buddy to get out, then started up the walkway toward the house. When he reached the front door, he stopped, took a deep breath, and knocked. He could hear the sounds of people inside, then footsteps as someone came to the door. Finally, the door was opened, and Johnny stared down at a toothless old black woman who looked like she was just short of a century in age. Uh, hello, Duke sent us, Johnny said after pulling himself together. The old woman looked at Johnny, then at Buddy. There was a glint of madness in her ancient eyes, a sparkle that frightened Johnny. The wrinkles in her black skin seemed etched into her face. Okay, young man, come on in. She stood back and held the door for the two young pickup men. Inside, Johnny found himself gasping for air. The little house was a mess with cracking walls and disintegrating furniture. And on every possible soft place, there rested a cat. All kinds of cats, from the big alley toms to the little striped house cats. Their stench was unmistakable. Obviously, the old woman never bothered to clean up after her little friends. Shit, Buddy exclaimed as the three walked through the living room into the kitchen. Exactly, Johnny agreed. The old woman led them into the kitchen, where there was another woman who looked even older than the first. She sat behind a large kitchen table, the glaring white light above giving her black flesh a gray, almost pallid look. When Johnny and Buddy entered the room, the second old woman looked up at them with fierce black eyes. She did not speak, but only sat there behind the table and glared at the two youths. 
Duke called and told us you was coming, the old woman who had answered the door said. That's fine, Johnny replied, now itching to get out of the place. The kitchen was hot, and with the white lights and stench from the cats, he was beginning to feel nauseous. He say you boys just starting, the old woman smiled, showing Johnny and Buddy nothing but wrinkled pink gums. Yeah, uh, listen, we got lots to do, so if you don't mind... All right, all right, always rushing round. Hey, buddy, always rushing, man. The old woman knelt down in front of the kitchen sink and opened the cabinet. She reached inside beneath the pipes and pulled out an envelope that was smothered in cockroaches. Jesus, fuck. Buddy stepped back against the wall. The sight of the roaches crawling up the old woman's arm had shocked him. He had never seen anything like it. The old woman casually brushed the little black bastards off the envelope, then off her arm. She handed the money to Johnny, grinning in a wicked, almost maddening way. Thanks, ma'am. We do appreciate it. Johnny looked down at the other woman sitting at the table and noticed that she was picking at the wood from the tabletop. He then saw that the rest of the table had been etched out in the same manner, leaving a scarred and ragged surface. Johnny started backing out of the kitchen, with Buddy moving quickly in front of him. The old woman followed them through the living room and to the front door. She looked as though she was herding them out of her house. The glint in her eyes was strong and seemed to possess the energy of madness. You boys come on back, you hear? We got some mind finding happenings up here. You know what I mean? Buddy opened the door and scampered out to the front lawn, Johnny backing out after him. The old woman stood at the door, smiling her toothless smile and cocking her hip outward with her hand placed demurely on her fleshless hip. Any time, boys, any time. Johnny and Buddy moved quickly to their car, got in, and raced away. When they had finally turned off the little street and onto Manchester Boulevard, they began to breathe easier. Johnny lit up a cigarette, then handed one to Buddy. Fuck, man, I ain't never seen no shit like that. Buddy inhaled deeply and sighed with relief as he let the smoke pour from his nostrils. That was some wicked shit, Buddy. How much bread we got from that place? Buddy turned the envelope over in his hands. It's sealed, bro, and I suspect the Duke wants it kept that way. Yeah, no doubt, my man, Johnny replied as he pulled out the paper with the addresses Duke had given him and read them quickly as he passed beneath a street sign. How much bread you got left from this morning, Buddy? Oh, shit, Buddy began. I guess about 50, maybe 70 bucks. Why? I was thinking, Johnny began. That after we make the next two pickups, since we got ourselves a few hours, we get a motel room somewhere, you know, stay out of sight in the off hours, shit like that. Why, man, we can even call up Anita, and she could bring a girlfriend, and we could have ourselves a little party. The idea sounded good. Johnny hadn't seen Anita for over three days, and the finely built girl was a keen source of pleasure for him. Buddy, on the other hand, hadn't had a woman since they had gone down to Big Mama's Pleasure Palace in San Pedro, and that had been over two months ago. Baby, Buddy began with a chuckle, I'm glad to see that at least one of us is thinking straight. Johnny laughed, then gunned his old Chevy and sped toward the next number's house. He was beginning to feel the ache in his loins as he thought about seeing Anita again. After the changes that had come during the last 24 hours, being with a bitch like Anita would provide the perfect tonic for whatever was ailing him. And even Johnny tried hard to keep the shit at the back of his mind. There were a number of things beginning to get to him. After making the next two collections, Johnny pulled into the Palm Crest Motel, a little courtyard of bungalows located near Compton Boulevard, about a mile from the Paradise Room. The manager, an aged black man with a powerful limp, had been more than agreeable to sign the two young blacks up. As far as they could see, there were no other occupants registered at the motel and the old man was desperate for tenants. 
Once inside the small paneled room, which contained two single beds and a dresser, Johnny and Buddy began to relax. They had stopped at Bert's liquor store and acquired a bottle of Red Mountain Burgundy. Bert was a long-time friend of the young blacks, always willing to give the kids a little of the juice for which he charged them an extra buck on every bottle. But it was worth the price to the young men who were underage. It always struck Johnny as funny that it was easier to score a hit of smack than it was to buy a bottle of liquor. Well, my man, Johnny said as he lay back on his bed and kicked the shoes off. When the girls get here, we can really start to relax. No shit, Johnny, Buddy replied, taking a long swig of his paper cup full of wine. No doubt Anita will bring some fine bitch, huh? That's what she said when I called her, bro. A fine brown bitch, that's what she said. Fucking shit, man, Buddy said loudly, jerking himself up off the bed and looking around the room. What the fuck happens when we get heavy with those bitches, man? I mean to say, brother, ain't no privacy here. Johnny looked around and laughed. Buddy was right, especially when there was a new bitch to be made. Shit, man, Johnny exclaimed. We'll have to fucking play it by ear. Maybe we could turn off the light or something, I don't know. I dig where you coming from, man, cause I sure got myself a nick that needs tending to. Buddy drank some more and filled Johnny's glass to the brim. They began to laugh and joke about the women they had known, trying to sound like older and wiser men of the world. Anita stretched her long brown body out against Johnny's and wrapped her leg across his stomach. Johnny moved up against her warm skin and stroked her back easily. In the other bed, Buddy was sound asleep next to the plump but pretty black girl whom Anita had brought with her. The night was successful for everyone, and the lights had been turned down and the two couples had moved in the same room. Only the sounds of pleasure had indicated to either of the couples that another couple was present in the same room. Other than that, it had been a very private affair. Now Johnny and Anita were laying side by side, their naked bodies touching at every point possible. Johnny smoked a cigarette and stared up at the darkened ceiling. That was good, Johnny, Anita whispered. Thanks, babe. It was mighty fine. There was a long silence as Johnny considered how he was going to tell his girlfriend about Jay. He had avoided the subject all night because he wanted the party to be successful. He needed Anita badly, and he didn't want to ruin it by telling her about Jay. But now, he knew that the time had come, and he would have to break the news. Finally, after a long silence, Johnny spoke. This time, his voice was soft and distant. Jay is dead, Anita, was all he said. He felt his woman's body tighten and her breathing stop. What? Jay... He was killed last night. Oh, baby, how? Johnny could hear the emotion in Anita's voice. Jay had practically grown up with all of them, and he was like a brother to Anita. But Johnny knew that. For right now, at least, he couldn't tell her the truth. There was no telling who the police were talking with and who they might approach in the future. Not allowing Anita any information was the best way of protecting her. Otherwise, she might give something away. Then, it would be horrible for her when the police questioned her. I don't know exactly. Me and Buddy went there this morning and his mother told us. She just said that he was killed last night. He held Anita tightly and waited for her reaction. All that came were muffled, sorrowful sobs. She buried her face into his shoulder, and Johnny held her tightly as he felt her warm, wet tears running down her cheeks and onto his shoulder. Her long, lean body was shaken with each sob. Johnny's mind traveled back to the day over a year ago when he had met Anita. It had been just before he had quit high school. Jordan High had thrown a sock op on a warm Friday night in November. The stylistics had been hired, and everyone around the school had been looking forward to the dance. The dance had only been an hour old when everyone stopped dancing as they heard the barrage of gunshots coming from the direction of the parking lot. Buddy, Jay, and Johnny had fled with everyone else toward the lot and had seen the five young black youths lying, bleeding, and dying on the concrete. 
It seemed that within minutes, the entire Los Angeles Police Department was on the scene, with riot guns and riot wagons surrounding the campus. The tall black girl had been trying desperately to push her way back through the excited crowd and into the gymnasium. Johnny had seen her and had liked the way she walked, her long, lean legs nicely revealed beneath a very short and very snug-fitting pair of hot pants. He had left Buddy and Jay and had followed her back through the crowd into the vacated gymnasium. Anita had fled to the far corner of the room and stood up against the wall, shaking. Johnny had approached her and she had broken down immediately. She told Johnny that she had been out in the parking lot smoking a cigarette with one of the members of the Black Plague, a local gang of teenage blacks that hung out at the high school. Suddenly, a maroon mercury had sped through the lot toward them, stopped and opened fire on the group of black youths. Anita had dived behind the nearest car and watched in horror as her schoolmates were shot down one after the other. That fiery night, Johnny had forced the hysterical girl to pull herself together. Then he had taken her through the police lines and to his car. He had then taken her out to a coffee shop and had stayed up all night talking with her. By early morning, the two teenagers found themselves lying side by side in Anita's bed. Anita's mother had been seeing a man at the time and dropped by the house only once a day to make sure that her daughter was all right. Since that night, much had happened. Johnny had quit school, realizing that with the constant shootings and chaotic happenings, he will never learn anything valuable that will allow him to survive. At 16 years of age, Johnny had realized that only by making it on the streets would he be able to survive in the jungle of the ghetto. But through all of that, he and Anita had stayed tight with each other. She was a bright, emotional girl and fine in bed. Johnny thanked his luck every time he gazed upon her soft features, her large, doe-like eyes, and her fine figure. With her beside him, Johnny felt he could never lose. Anita's sobbing had stopped, and she looked up at Johnny. Her large, brown eyes were tear-stained, and her lips were moist. Baby, she said softly, I know you ain't telling me everything. But you got to promise me that you'll be careful. Would you do that? Johnny had a smile. He could never fool Anita. Sure, honey, I'll be careful. I ain't telling it all because it's better that way. You know that. Yeah. Anita replied, kissing him lightly on the cheek. I believe you. I always believe you. You just stay with me, honey, and we'll do all right. I'm going to make it someday, and I'm going to get everyone out of this fucking place. You trust me, and we'll make it together. Anita planted her mouth fully on Johnny's. Her lush lips parted, and she entered his mouth with her tongue. At that moment, there was no doubt in Johnny's mind as to how he felt. The day had been a nightmare that transformed into a much better dreamlike state. Everything had changed so quickly that Johnny was barely able to keep his balance, but once in the arms of Anita, he found himself again and was able to relax. Now only one more run for Duke, and he and Buddy will be able to return to the motel room for the rest of the night. At one o'clock, Johnny and Buddy dressed and left their sleeping women. They would speed through their pickups and rush back to the Palm Crest Motel. As the two black youths drove away from the motel, they both felt a strange, unfamiliar feeling. For the first time in their young lives, Johnny and Buddy were looking forward to coming home. Even though that home was a dilapidated old motor court with no attraction to it except for the two brown-skinned teenage girls who now slept soundly inside. Chapter 7 Leslie woke up in a large circular bed and reached for the massive figure of Duke, but all she found were sheets and blankets. Each morning, for a solid week now, Leslie had awakened to the sweet love-making of the big man. Each day had begun with his forceful, powerful attentions, and each day had ended in the same way. But now he was gone, and Leslie felt the pang of apprehension at his disappearance. 
Quickly, she jumped out of bed and walked naked into the living room. She searched through the kitchen, then back in the main room again. She sighed to herself, realizing that her worries were foolish. She knew that Duke was a busy man and had business to take care of. For the week that she had been there, it was blissful and exciting. But deep down inside, she knew it would have to taper off sometime. It saddened her that that time had finally arrived. Leslie had never been happier in her entire life. Duke had provided her with everything that she had ever wanted. Clothes, presents of stuffed animals, and had loved her completely and constantly. She had not left the apartment above the Paradise Room during the entire week and would have stayed in the love nest for the rest of her life had Duke only asked her. Now alone, without the comforting, totally fulfilling presence of her man, the young black girl thought about her parents. After that first night, she had called home and told her mother that she would be away for a while. Her mother had become hysterical and demanded to know where her daughter was. Leslie told her that she was fine and that she would be sending money as soon as she could. But now she began thinking again of her sorrowful parents. She imagined them sitting in front of the damn television set, not talking, but just staring as though they were more dead than alive. The image brought a sob to Leslie's throat, but she managed to stifle it. Duke will be back soon, she thought, and rid her of those thoughts. She knew that she needed the man more than ever, more than she ever needed anyone in her entire life. The day passed, and Leslie spent most of it watching the television. During those long hours, every time she heard a noise, she jumped up and ran to the window that overlooked the street in front of the club. But each time she peered expectantly out onto the street, she was disappointed. Duke had not even bothered to call, and Leslie was beginning to know the fear of being left alone. Duke stretched out his long legs as he sat in the back seat of his Cadillac and watched a young teenage black girl eating a hot dog next to him. He had spotted her earlier in the morning as he stood gazing out of the window of his apartment. Leslie had been sleeping soundly and had not seen him race for his clothes and bolt out of the apartment. As Duke sat with the little black girl now, his mind raced back to the thought of Leslie. It wasn't with guilt or love with which he thought of the young bitch with whom he had just spent a fulfilling week, but rather it was with cold calculation. He was trying to determine the best way to get rid of her and instate this new girl into his apartment. It was always that way with Duke, and the man never tried to correct or deal with his sickness. Young teenage girls had always been an obsession with him, and his continuing changing of bitches never occurred to him as something abnormal. Instead, he just continued doing what he had been doing for the last four years. Hey boss, Joe called from the front seat. We got to get out of this neighborhood pretty soon. Duke, after picking up his newest addition to the stable, had directed Joe to drive him to a park he knew about in the city of Compton. There he had convinced the little brown-skinned girl to perform upon him. Now he had to make his decision. Okay, Joe, drop Jenny here off at the house and we'll take care of business. Right, boss. Joe started the car and drove away from the park, heading back towards Watts. It was late in the afternoon, and the Duke hoped that he could have Leslie taken care of by nightfall. Then he could get things going with this new brown bitch of a girl. As Duke entered the apartment, Leslie felt a huge flood of relief surge through her veins. She jumped up from the couch and ran to him, throwing her arms around his large shoulders. Oh, Daddy! Daddy! Baby! It's good you came home! Duke looked down at the beautiful young black girl and thought for a second of changing his plans. But the image of Jenny had already begun replacing that of Leslie. It was too late to turn back now. Hey, bitch, I got some bad news, he said coldly, pushing Leslie away from him. She looked up at him with her large brown eyes, feeling her body beginning to stiffen. See, honey, Duke began, I got business to take care of for a week or so, and we got to have this place. I'm going to put you up with Molly, a main chick of mine who'll take care of you. Oh, 
Leslie felt herself sinking, but there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Can I still see you, Elliot? I mean, if I go stay with Molly? Sure, honey, no problem, baby. We'll be together every night. It's just this fucking business came up, and I gotta handle it. As Leslie packed her newly purchased clothes into a suitcase, she felt better. Duke wasn't lying to her, she believed, and things would work out again like they had been. Joe came up to the apartment a moment later and took the suitcase down to the Cadillac. Leslie stood in the living room with Duke. She threw her arms around him, kissed him, then withdrew when he didn't respond. You go down there with Joe, Les, and I'll catch you tonight. You dig where I'm coming from? Yes, Elliot. I'll be waiting. Beautiful. Beautiful. The Duke held the door for her, then went to the window and waited for her to emerge onto the sidewalk in front of the club. He smiled to himself as he watched her get into his Cadillac and drive off with Joe towards Molly's. Man, he thought to himself, she was nowhere. I mean, she didn't even know what was happening to her when it was coming down. As Duke shuffled back into the bathroom and began showering, he knew that the next time he saw Leslie, she would no longer be a little girl. Most of them came out of Duke's personal little workshop as heartened, cold women, bitches who will work the streets for the rest of their lives. Joe drove down Slauson towards Adams Boulevard. Leslie watched the passing scenery, the clubs, the bars, the markets, and the motels all seemed to blur themselves in her mind. Even though she knew where she was, she failed to recognize the familiar territory. The stock of what had just happened back at Duke's still hadn't worn off. The car finally slowed down and stopped in front of a modern apartment house on Slauson. The exterior of the building sported palm trees and a little bit of grass around the sidewalk. Joe hustled out of the car, opened Leslie's door, and waited for the young black girl to climb out of the back seat. Leslie got to her feet and stood in front of the apartment building. This is Molly's, baby. You'll dig on her. Joe took Leslie's arm and held the suitcase in his other hand as he led her through the iron gates and into the courtyard of the apartment building. It was almost sunset, and the shadows were creeping up the side of the open-air patio. On the second floor at the end of the balcony, Joe stopped in front of apartment number five. He knocked three times on the door, then waited. The woman who answered the door was a middle-aged black and had obviously once been a beauty. She glanced out at Joe, then allowed her eyes to roam down to Leslie. She smiled when she saw the beautiful teenager. Fucking shit, Joe! He told me she was pretty, but that's too much. Leslie found herself blushing as she walked into the well-furnished modern apartment. The place was spacious and fine furniture was everywhere. There was even a huge color television set off in one corner of the room. Molly was introduced to Leslie, then she and Joe made their way out onto the patio and whispered quietly to one another for a number of minutes. Leslie spent the time looking at the beautiful paintings on the wall and the vast array of books on the shelves. She had never seen so many books in one place before. Finally, Molly came back inside, closing the door behind her. Well, honey, welcome to the home. Thanks, Leslie replied. But I won't bother you for long. Elliot will be only a week or so, and then I'll go back with him. Molly's hard eyes softened for a moment as she regarded this beautiful, obviously innocent young girl. You bet, baby. But for now, we got to get along and I got to take care, you dig? Leslie nodded, feeling an instant affection for this outgoing, lively woman. She was so much different than her mother. She smiled so much that Leslie couldn't help being attracted to her. Okay, baby, Molly began, heading toward the kitchen. Let's you and I make some dinner, then we'll have a little chat. Happily, Leslie followed Molly into the well-kept kitchen. She was delighted by the vast amount of food that was stacked in all the cupboards. It was way past three o'clock in the morning, and Duke had not shown up at Molly's apartment. Leslie sat staring at the television set, her face blank, and her dark eyes empty and sad. Molly sat on the couch across the room and watched her visitor closely. This was not the first time Molly had gone through this type of scene with one of Duke's young girls. As a matter of fact, it was nearly the twentieth time for Molly. 
Ever since she had been taken under Duke's wing, strung out on heroin, she had become the number one lady amongst the young whores whom Duke recruited. It was Molly's job to console the girls after being dumped by Duke, then to offer the young innocent black teenagers another way out. None of them so far had ever refused Molly's offer of white powder and steady income for the rest of their lives. After being with Duke, the girls were ready for anything and hoped that by following Molly's encouragement, they would someday get back with Duke. Of course, this never did happen. You all right, honey? Molly asked as the television station signed off for the night. Leslie nodded, then got up slowly and turned off the television set. I don't know what happened, Molly. He was supposed to come by. Molly felt her stomach clench. Of all the times she had done this, this girl was going to be the most difficult. She was very beautiful and very naive. That always made it worse. Listen, honey, Molly began. Men are like that. They'll take you so high you don't ever think you're coming down. Then for no reason, they'll just dump you into the pit. It's always like that, baby. Always. But I can't believe it. We were in love, Molly. Me and Elliot. Leslie could feel it tighten within herself, the realization that she had been dropped. Yeah, yeah, they always say that. The man is a fucking bastard, Leslie, and we women got to stick together on account of that. The young black teenager curled up on the end of the couch and looked at Molly openly. I guess we do, Molly. I guess we do. Listen, baby, Molly began again. Why don't you just pack it in? and split back to your mama's house. Get yourself back into school and meet some nice young dude. No, Leslie replied. I can't do that. I could never go back there. Never. Molly sighed. It was always that way. Once out into the real world, the girls would never go back and try to get a fresh start. They had to ride it out, to take the chance that what they had had with Duke would someday materialize again. Okay, honey, have it your way. But this mama's got to get herself some fixings to help the pain. You just excuse me for a moment, huh? Leslie watched a middle-aged black woman walk out of the room and down the hallway toward her bedroom. It had been a horrible night, and Leslie had thought of going home when she had realized that she and Elliot were through. But that had been two hours ago, and after thinking of her brother Johnny and her parents, she had decided that she would never be able to face any of them again. She was on her own now, and she knew it. There was no place left for her to go but where she was. Now, and only now, is all I got left, she kept telling herself time and time again. Molly returned to the living room with a little silver spoon in one hand and a small plastic bag filled with white powder in the other. Leslie knew that it was dope, most likely heroin, and her heart froze. She had never known an attic before, and now she was sitting in the same room with one. Don't mind me, Leslie. This shit's for the pain, is all. Leslie watched closely as Molly poured a little of the powder onto the spoon, then placed the cupped end in her nostril and inhaled deeply. A smile crossed the older woman's face as the first rush went screaming through her system. Ah, yeah, child. It's better than men any time. The younger black girl was at the mercy of her emotions now, and she could not stop herself. She asked Molly for a hit of the stuff, just for this one time, so that she too could stifle the terrible ache she felt in her gut. Molly at first refused, toying with the teenager in order to make her demand the stuff. Finally, Leslie placed a small spoon inside her nostril and inhaled deeply as Molly had done. Her laughter was hysterical and high-pitched. The teenage girl shook with it as she sat on the couch. Nothing seemed to matter anymore. Not Duke, not her parents, not even her brother. Everything was mellow now, smooth to such a degree that only laughter could express the relief she felt as her problems and her pain drifted out of her consciousness in an easy, graceful flow. See what I mean, baby? Molly asked after Leslie's laughter had died to a gentle chuckle. Yeah, Leslie replied. Fuck him! Fuck Elliot! Then Leslie began laughing again. 
She rarely, if ever, used profanities, and the sound of the words emanating from her own lips seemed to her, at the moment, to be the funniest thing she had ever heard. I hate to do this, but we're gonna have to pause for the cause just because I'm gonna need y'all to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads. I would like, or rather love, to thank you queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. Send a friend request to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where, if you would like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407 or cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me on my other channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, and right here on TURN, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the continuation of this Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Try to keep your nose clean, please.